Good evening, everybody. My name is Jennifer Lee, and I'm a comprehensive specialist of the ears, nose, and throat in the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery. I see patients and operate on patients on all pathologies above the clavicle, minus the brain, and the eyes. I'd like to thank you all for inviting me to talk to you today about the management of chronic rhinosinusitis. I have no financial disclosures. Today's talk is designed for Mr. Smith. He thinks he has sinusitis, so let's see how we can help him today. He wants to start off by knowing why should he care about sinusitis? Well, for one thing, it's quite common. About 15% of the U.S. population deals with rhinosinusitis. Just as a point of com comparison, the American Diabetes Association in 2013 reported that 8.3% of the U.S. population has diabetes. There's a significant amount of health dollars spent per year. That's more than money spent in allergies, asthma, or ulcers. There's a lot of work days missed. And patients report a worse quality of life than CHF or congestive heart failure, or COPD. So we've convinced Mr. Smith that rhinosinusitis is important, but he wants to know what are sinuses? Sinuses are holes in the face and the skull. We have four pairs. There is the frontal, the ethmoid, the maxillary, and the sphenoid sinuses. Most commonly, the maxillary and ethmoid sinuses are affected in chronic rhinosinusitis. I'd like to make an important note about the frontal sinus sinuses. About 5 to 8% of the population have either a missing or uh, a hypoplastic, so a small frontal sinus, or no frontal sinuses at all. So if I have a patient that comes in primarily with headaches and no other, real, uh, other concerning symptoms, then I like to think of neurologic etiology. So we know what sinuses are, but what do they do? And the answer is we don't really know. We have five theories on what sinuses do for us. The first theory is that it has lightened our head so we're able to walk. The second is that it's functions as a buffer zone for trauma to protect our eyes and our brains. Or it may be involved in resonance of our voice so that our voice can carry. Or it may be involved in humidification and moisture of the filtered air. Or it may actually involve filtering the air. So we know what sinuses are. We know what they may do. But what is sinusitis? Well, there have been two different clinical practice guidelines, both in the US as well as in the Europe, that have gotten together to create a definition for rhinosinusitis. And it is symptomatic inflammation of the paranasal sinuses and nasal cavity. That changes the way we used to think about chronic sinusitis as more of an infectious e uh, disease to more, currently, we think of it more as an inflammatory disease. So how do we diagnose rhinosinusitis? After all, Mr. Smith wants to know if he has it or not. So there are two aspects of the diagnosis of rhinosinusitis. First, there's a temporal relationship between symptoms and the kind of rhinosinusitis you may have. Symptoms for less than four weeks, we consider acute rhinosinusitis. For greater than 12 weeks, chronic rhinosinusitis. And in between is subacute. Today, we're going to focus mainly on chronic rhinosinusitis. So what are the symptoms? This is a table showing the most common symptoms that people have in chronic rhinosinusitis. The important things I like to point out is smell and discolored discharge in the nose uh, that wasn't previously described. 
So taking all these symptoms into account, we have developed guidelines, as I mentioned both here as well as in Europe, to help clinicians make the diagnosis of chronic rhinosinusitis. Some of the things I'd like to emphasize is the importance of history and the importance of the physical exam in terms of finding or trying to see some signs of inflammation or discolored discharge or masses. And the new change is also a decrease in emphasis in radiologic imaging. So, as mentioned previously, the definition of rhinosinusitis is symptomatic inflammation. So how do we quantify those symptoms? There have been many validated quality of life measures that look at these symptoms, how bad these symptoms are for our patients, and how they change with treatment. This is the one that we prefer, and it's called the Sinonasal Outcome Test 22, because there's 22 questions, also known as SNOT-22. <laughs> you should see the SNOT-10 then. So uh, we like these because it tells us not just what, uh, how badly it's affecting our patients, but also what our patients find to be the most important symptoms. And we can monitor uh, how these symptoms change with treatment. Now, the important thing, as I mentioned, is that this is not the only validated studies, and there are many others. So let's go back to Mr. Smith. He scores a 30 on the SNOT 22. Anything above 7 is considered normal, and anything above 19 is considered concerning for chronic rhinosinusitis. So he scores a 30. But what does his exam show? To the otolaryngologist, we have three methods of examining the nose. The first is the anterior rhinoscopy. The second is called the rigid nasal endoscopy. Third is the flexible endoscopy. And here are some examples of what we may see. I thought you, would, might, you might find it interesting to be able to see some of the things that we describe. So we'll start with a normal nasal cavity. This is the right nasal cavity. You can see this is the septum. This is the middle turbinate. And the mucosa, this would, we would consider this normal mucosa. This, as you can see in comparison, the nasal cavity is narrowed. There's more swelling, and there's purulent discharge. And we are making a push to try to culture these purulent discharges when we find them so that we can give uh, culture-directed antibiotic therapy when necessary. This is an in example of inflammation. You can see the erythema, the redness of the middle turbinate. You can see some discharge. And you can see this is what polyps look like. It's the watery uh, fluid, much like a grape when you peel off the skin. This is also an example of polyps. You can see more clearly the polyps. It looks like a watery uh, tissue. And this is what we call allergic mucin. It looks like a peanut butter speckled with some gold dust. Uh, this is a portion of what we call allergic fungal sinusitis. It's actually a misnomer uh, because it's an inflammatory reaction, not necessarily a fungal infection. Well, we've looked at the tools, and now let's take a moment to talk about imaging. As I previously mentioned, the practice guidelines are emphasizing more on exam and less on imaging. However, imaging should be considered early if there are certain symptoms, such as unilateral symptoms, bleeding, bad smells or odors, eye symptoms, or neurologic symptoms. So let's say that our patient does have these concerning symptoms. What would you do? 
The recommended study will be a non-contrast CAT scan of the sinuses with coronal or facial cuts. An average CT of the sinus gives about 0.6 millisurveys of radiation, or 60 millirems. As a point of reference, the average U.S. American doing nothing will get 620 millirems. So these are some examples of what we may see. Excuse me. So on the right, you can see allergic mucin. That is what allergic mucin would look like. And this is polyps on one side. These are more amenable to uh, surgical treatments. Uh, medical th treatments could be more difficult to provide uh, symptomatic relief. And this is an example of what we would see in a chronic rhinosinusitis prior after medical therapy has failed. So we've gone through how to diagnose chronic rhinosinusitis. And now Mr. Smith wants to know what we can do about it. So let's see how we can help him. Before we can understand how we medically treat chronic rhinosinusitis, let's look at three main areas of pathophysiology of rhinosinusitis. There's mucociliary dysfunction. So what happens is that our sinuses are lined with cilia that beat at a regular frequency. And there may be something that causes dysfunction of that cilia. We know that it could be an anatomical issue or a genetic issue, or sometimes it can be environmental such as uh, smoke, for instance, can cause ciliary dysfunction. And hence, there's stasis or non-movement of the sinus fluids, which can then become infected or it can cause inflammation. The second is inflammation itself. We think there is an interplay between allergy and inflammation as well. When we look at Th1 and Th2, these are different aspects of our immune system and how we react. Th1 is more, uh, involves more neutrophils. This is more what we see in chronic rhinosinusitis without polyps, the uh, grape-like structures you can see in the nose. And those mediators are more like IL-2 or TN-alpha. Then there is Th2 or more of an allergic response, and we see that more with chronic rhinosinusitis with polyps and it's more mediated by eosinophils. Thirdly, there can be uh, some level of infection. So this is an example of biofilms. Biofilms are communities of bacteria that form to form uh, a community that can then adhere to a surface and then be more resistant to treatment. So what can we do uh, in terms of affecting these areas? Our first line of treatment is nasal saline. These are examples of some bottles that you can purchase over the counter. This is the one that uh, I prefer. Uh, the reason why I prefer this is because it gives the patient control uh, of how hard they squeeze that bottle, controls how much, and how uh, rapidly the fluid comes out. And usually I recommend my patients to fill up to this line with distilled water, never tap water. It can be boiled water cooled or bottled water or distilled water with a salt packet that can be purchased with the bottle or you can also make it at home with salt and baking soda. I advise my patients to lean over a sink or in the shower straight and I instruct them to put the saline in one side, and I let them know it may come out of the same side or both sides, and even sometimes it may come out of your mouth if you squeeze very hard. That way, patients expect uh, know what to expect when they start rinsing at home. So do sinus saline irrigations work? And the answer is yes, it does work. This is a meta-analysis of several studies, and essentially it shows that it favors treatment or the use of nasal saline. Interestingly, in a follow-up study by Robago in 2005, 
uh, patients, 95% of patients recommended to other people to use nasal saline irrigations. Another question I often get is, does it matter if it's a spray or a saline irrigation? And at least according to a study in 2009 with Bueller, the, tr the answer is yes. Uh, at least 100 milliliters of saline irrigation should be used to provide some therapeutic or a symptomatic relief. So the next line of treatment for our patients is topical nasal steroids. There are, these are some more popular brands. This is an over-counter uh, nasal topical steroid. And I've listed for you here the potency. There, there are ones that have low potency. Uh, what does that mean? It's not, what I mean by low potency is not that it's not as effective, but rather the systemic side effects, the bioabsorbability for a spray is very little, comparatively to some of our other topical nasal sprays. There has been one study that showed that there was some growth retardation or delay in growth in our children for only beclomethazone. We often use uh, fluticasone or flonase or mometazone or nasonex in children all the way to all ages safely. And the attractiveness of the topical nasal steroid is that the systemic side effects, such as uh, side effects of cataracts, osteoporosis, ulcers, and other joint issues are less if you have a topical delivery. What are the most common side effects I hear is nasal drying or epistaxis or bloody nose. I ask my patients when they spray the spray to aim towards the sinuses or towards the cheek and ear, towards the back of their head, rather than the middle where you can have more drying side effects or more bleeding side effects because the middle septum is, is very vascular. So do topical nasal steroids work? And it looks as though in our meta-analysis, the answer is yes. Now, there's a caveat that I'd like to talk about next. If you can, when we look at the breakdown of these doses that were given in these randomized controlled trials, you can see that the dose was 200 micrograms twice a day. If you look at the dose on a Flonase bottle, it's 50 micrograms per spray. So the question is, if we assume that the formulation is the same, then the dose should be two sprays each side twice a day, or eight sprays a day, which is more than most patients that are referred to me see or are, are using at home. They often are using one spray once a day or two sprays once a day. What about other medical therapies, such as oral antibiotics? So there have been several well-designed controlled cohort studies showing the effectiveness of short-term courses of antibiotics, such as Augmentin, Ciprofloxacin, Levoquin, Clindamycin with Bactrim, or Azithromycin. There is one randomized controlled trial by Wall Work in 2006 that looked at 64 patients for chronic or long-term oral antibiotic therapy with a macrolide called roxithromycin. And 150 milligrams of this dose was given daily for three months versus say placebo or sugar pill. And the study reported a statistically significant difference in symptoms, as well as physical exam on nasal endoscopy and inflammatory mediators on saline lavage. Unfortunately, it's not available in the US. So if oral antibiotics work, do topical antibiotics work? And it seems that the short answer would be yes, at least for short-term effects. 
Mupiracin is a uh, antibiotic that works against Staph aureus. And Staph aureus has been shown to be most common and cultured in chronic rhinosinusitis. And this is a study that shows uh, in 2012, they looked at 25 patients and randomized them to get mupiracin in the saline irrigation bottle versus just saline irrigation. And it was a blinded study, so the patient did not know which uh, treatment arm they were getting. And they looked at both the symptom response score on a SNOT score and what their nasal endoscopy looked like and whether the culture, which was positive before, if it became negative after treatment. And it shows that after one month, there was a significant decrease. However, when we carried them forward, we could not see that uh, significant difference at two months or six months. So what about other treatments? Are there other things that work? And that, the jury's still out. There are several studies, controlled, well-designed studies, that show that oral steroids are helpful temporarily. But uh, there are also more of a level four means that it's more of a uh, expert opinion in terms of whether it works or not. Now, there are theories in the unified airway theory that are idea that uh, certain issues with the lung can also relate to issues to the uh, sinus and vice versa. So there have been mucolytis or other uh, therapies that have been tried, and they look like they work in small studies, but we don't know yet whether it's going to pan out. Now, I would like to take a moment here, however, to emphasize a certain aspect about fungus. It has, so far, it seems that fungus does not seem to be a significant effect on chronic rhinosinusitis without polyps. And the topical treatment, amphotericin, has now been shown to not be effective compared to controls. So for that, we do have an answer, and that is it would not be recommended. So we've gone over the etiology and the medical treatment. Well, what about surgical therapies? When does one operate? Well, that's different for each surgeon. And I would say, for me, it involves a trial of what I like to call maximal medical therapy. And maximal medical therapy is different depending on the clinician. For myself, it means that the patient is using nasal saline at least twice a day. They are using the correct dose for topical nasal steroids for a three-month trial. They have a history of at least trying oral steroids or antibiotics. For some, it may be that the side effects of oral steroids was too much. For some, it may be that the antibiotics have become too frequent. That's when I decide that it's time that we need to operate. So what is surgery like for us? Well, for me, in my hands, it's an outpatient surgery. It's performed at the surgical center. And we use the same type of instruments that I showed you before, the nasal endoscope. They're small instruments that go inside the nose. There are no incisions placed on the outside of the face. There's no bruising under the eyes. And we collectively have been moving away from nasal packing. And I preferably do not use nasal packing uh, where you come out with your nose all packed in. And part of that is also because our technology and our equipment have gotten better. Uh, and finally, I like to talk about image guidance. So now we are uh, frequently using CAT scans, like I showed before, as sort of a mapping system. So during surgery, if there's any question, or uh, we can use the image to kind of confirm where we are. So does surgery work? 
Well, that depends on how you define success. If you want success to be to never have another sinus infection, maybe not so good. If you want to define uh, success as an improvement in symptoms, so you're not using all those medications as much or as often, and you feel better, and you can work and function, then the answer is yes, it's successful. So there are different studies that quote different percentages, from 75% to uh, greater than 90%. This is one example of one of our many studies that show that the symptom response is significantly decreased with treatment before and after surgery. Now, the key point in mind is that for us, in our hands, we don't operate, most of us are, tend not to operate on people unless they have failed medical therapy. We're not trying these on people who just walk in with the symptoms. We, try, we use surgery as an adjuvant after they have failed medical therapy. So sometimes a video can tell a lot more than the words that I can say. So I'd like to show you here, this will be a relatively normal nasal mucosa. And in comparison, I'm going to show you a very narrowed nasal cavity. As you can see, you can imagine how it will be difficult to get any irrigation or topical steroids or topical antibiotics into a nose that narrow. Now in comparison, this is a video of the same patient after surgery. And you can see how open the nasal cavity is, how open the sinuses are. And there's no exposed bone. Everything is nicely mucosalized. And you can see that topical antibiotics, topical steroids, or just simply saline will have a much easier time getting in and being effective. So let's talk about future directions. S chronic rhinosinusitis in the study of rhinology is a constantly evolving field. And that's one of my favorite things about the specialty that I'm in. So some of the things that are coming out, there are constantly studies coming out. And on the left here, you can see uh, balloons. And balloons are more of a tool to help us open sinuses. This on the right, you can see, is a drug-eluting stents. We are looking at steroids uh, to help produce local effects and also allow opening of the sinuses and to keep it open. And eventually, there may be, who knows, a robot that'll go in the nose. So I'd like to take the time to thank my mentors. Uh, without these people, I would not be here. They have inspired me, motivated me, and to this day, they continue to advise me. I really appreciate your time, and I'd like to thank you for being here and giving me your attention and your time. Yes? Why purify water when you irrigate your sinuses? So the issue is uh, the sinuses are, they do have some bacteria in it. We know that they are colonized. So the question, sorry, excuse me. The question is why irrigate the nose with purified water if it's the sinus? So my, the sinuses are known to have colonized bacteria in them, even in normal sinuses versus uh, chronic rhinosinusitis. Uh, think of it as a delicate balance. And then the issue is, well, do we really know what's in that tap water? There have been uh, reports uh, in other countries about flesh-eating amoebas. I don't want to scare anybody here. Uh, but that is one of the reasons why we use distilled uh, water or boiled water. Tap water you can boil, cool, and use as well. For the last year, my brother walks out in the ocean and blows it through his nose, and he says that's great for him. Now he's claimed to have asthma. Is there a relationship between asthma and this? 
So the question was, if you go into the ocean and you blow salt water in your nose and you feel great, um, and he has asthma, is there a connection between asthma and also uh, rhinosinusitis? And the answer is yes, uh, at least we think so. Uh, as we, I mentioned before, there is the unified airway concept, meaning that our nose, our sinuses, our throats, and then our lungs are connected in a unified airway. So inflammation that is occurring in our sinuses and postnasal drip, you can imagine that purulent discharge, if it was coming out enough, dripping into the back of your nose, into your throat, and you went down the wrong pipe, then you can also have a lung infection. So there's ideas, but also the issue of inflammation, and that's really the key here. Uh, how much inflammation is occurring in the nose. If there's inflammation in the nose, then the same respiratory epithelium that it can occur in the lungs, could one not also have inflammation in the lungs? And we think that that is the case. And we think that because when we treat these people for their sinuses, their asthma also gets better in terms of decreased need for rescue inhalers. Go for it. You'd written a paper that mentioned ear fullness as a symptom, and I noticed it was on one of your early charts, but it wasn't on the, on the post-surgical one to say how would it come out. I was given a different explanation of superior canal dehiscence for my ear fullness, but it came on during a sinus infection, and I just wondered if you could address ear fullness and sinus problems. Sure. The question was, could you address ear fullness and sinus issues? Um, so ear fullness the ears and the nose are connected with each other as well. In the back of the nose, we have something called the eustachian tube, which is connected to the middle portion of your ear. Your ear has an outer, a middle, and an inner portion. And the eustachian tube connects the middle portion of your ear to the back of your nose. So can you have ear fullness if you have a sinus infection? Yes. But can you also have ear fullness from other causes as well, the answer is yes. So if you have diseases within the middle ear, that can also lead to ear fullness. Does that answer your question? I guess I'm asking whether your mode of going at sinus problems, since, you, since it was in your early chart but not in your later one of post-surgical results, whether you've seen opening of ear fullness that has gone on for years post-surgery? Yes, we do. Uh, so we, there are, as I mentioned, validated symptom scores that we use before and after. And I didn't show that particular aspect, but yes. The question was, does earfulness improve if we were to open the sinuses? And the answer is yes. It does improve if the main etiology of the earfulness tends to be sinuses. Uh, it really depends on the rest of the history and the physical exam. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, you said you irrigate with saline, so you can add salt to the boiled water. Correct. Uh, but don't you also add soda like uh, Yes. Uh, Baking soda. Yes. yes. So uh, if you, there are two ways we can do this. You can buy a salt packet that already has a pH balanced salt to bicarbonate uh, proportion. Or I also have a recipe that I give to my patients that shows how much water to how much salt to how much baking soda you would put in at home. For people, after a while, if you're using these for years and years, it can, the cost can add up. So I do give a recipe that you can make at home. Sure, we can give you the recipe. That's absolutely not a problem. <laughs> yes. It was uh, made by my mentors. Yes. How about a connection with periodontal problems? Yes. So the question was, is there a connection between sinuses and periodontal disease? And the answer is there is a connection. And uh, part of the connection is depends on your teeth. So the maxillary, so the upper teeth, do the roots can... Uh, I wouldn't say grow, but can be within the borders between the sinuses and the teeth. And if you have a very long tooth, in some cases, they can, the root can actually protrude into the maxillary or sinuses of the cheek. If you had a very bad infection of any of these teeth or tooth or teeth, would, could you have sinusitis? The answer is yes. 
And the reverse is also true. For some people who have very bad maxillary sinusitis, they may come in and say to me that they have some toothaches, some dull aching in their upper teeth. Describe the surgical process a little bit in more detail. Do you cauterize, do you cut, and how long does it take to recover? Absolutely. So the question was, describe the surgery in more detail. So the surgery, as I mentioned, is an outpatient surgery. Uh, the patient comes in, they go to the operating room, and it takes about, at least in my hands, probably about two hours or so for both sizes. Uh, so it does not, uh, I use the, metal rigid uh, camera that I showed earlier. It's a small camera, a little bit smaller than a chopstick, I would say. And there are instruments, and what I do is, I describe it as the holes that you have in your body, in your sinuses, I make them bigger. So what does that involve? That in, especially for chronic rhinosinusitis, as I mentioned, the etiology is inflammation. So we often see thickening of bone. And because of that reason, that bone and tissue has to be removed. And that's done with instruments that basically cut small portions of that bone and mucosa. And we allow everything to heal back up. Uh, and uh, the recovery process. So the day of surgery, patients tend to go home. They're usually pretty tired the day and the day after, mainly from the side effects of having a surgery, not just the side effects of having nasal surgery. Um, people are able to eat, walk, do whatever they want to do the next day. Um, you can have a little bit of a bloody nose, uh, especially uh, the day of or the day after surgery. And the reason, as I mentioned, is I do not tend to pack my patient's noses. Uh, and because of that reason, and I can't put a Band-Aid inside the nose, so those areas, as it heals up, can have a little bit of bloody discharge. And that's expected, and that would be normal. Uh, and over the course of several days, the bloody discharge goes down and uh, patients start to uh, feel better. Initially, I tell people that they will have some sense of more swelling than they did uh, after, before the surgery, at least temporarily, while things are healing. And the healing process, I tell them, can take, I usually quote about a week. Uh, of, uh, as tell, I ask my patients to ask their job that they will be out for at least a week. If you decide to go back earlier, that's okay. But um, I ask them to try to reserve about a week of time. What happens to the cilia during surgery? So the areas, uh, so I, the short answer would be, I'm not sure. Uh, could there be some level of temporary uh, pro injury? I think probably, but I, we haven't really looked at that per se. Uh, or I'm not, I'm not aware of studies that look specifically at that. But we do know that after surgery, the cilia do, does work, uh, especially in chronic sinusitis where that fluid has stayed there and is sitting there and is having a difficult time coming out. When we've opened sinuses and allowed the medications to go in and start working, we can see that things are then starting to move. Yes? Uh, if you have a deviated septum, and you have an eardrum that's damaged and no water can get in there. Can you use one of these neti pots? So the question was, if you have a hole in your eardrum and you have a deviated septum, can you use a neti pot? In theory, the answer is yes, you can use it. Could you get fluid in your ear? You can, uh, which is why I tend to use the neosaline instead of the neti pot. The neti pot is more of the blue kettle. And the way it's done is you have to tilt your head to put in the kettle is more of a pour. The benefit of the kettle is that it's more uh, as a gentler irrigation. The issue in my mind, or at least that's what my patients are saying, is that it gives them, a, it gives them more ear fullness because they feel like the water is going into their ear. So I try to have my patients irrigate leaning forward, and I ask them often to press just a little bit to see how they feel. Uh, so that's why the control is in the patient's hand to how much they can irrigate, as long as they get through, at least put in 100. Can you speak a little bit about um, allergy-induced rhinosinusitis, and how would you treat um, between the options of allergy medication and relief of symptoms in the moment that you have the symptoms, and also in the moment if you don't have the symptoms? It's like a catch-22, right? 
you have to relieve the symptoms, and then if you don't have symptoms, why take yes. medication? So the question was, can, can I speak about uh, allergy-induced uh, sinusitis, so uh, rhinosinusitis? So yes, that is the hard thing about allergy-induced rhinosinusitis. It's sort of a cycle. And part of the way, as I mentioned, you can see the, uh, in the pathophys, the slide, you saw the interplay of the cycle between allergy, infection, as well as mucociliary dysfunction. And the idea is that these topical nasal steroids, and especially if it's allergy-induced, we, uh, we will often add an antihistamine spray. And they tend to work, I like to describe this as a well-working couple. So if you have a good couple that works together well, they make each other better. So the antihistamine spray, as well as a topical na uh, nasal steroid spray, together, when used together for allergic sinusitis, seems to improve their symptoms. However, the caveat is that you have to use it all the time. So often the dosing is twice a day, it's every day, like brushing your teeth. So what I'd like to tell my patients is, will hopefully you like to brush your teeth at least twice a day. So the idea is, it's just another routine of your day. Uh, brush your teeth, spray your nose. Brush your teeth, rinse your nose. So when you think of it that way, I think it becomes less of a burden than I'm not sure why I'm taking this. Because what it does is it allows you to break that cycle so that you can now get symptom control. Do you over irrigate too much? I mean, if the symptoms disappear, should you still continue as part of your normal routine? So could you, the question is, can you overdose on nasal saline? And the answer is no. Uh, I took out a video about rinsing all the time, but uh, you can rinse as often as a patient would like. We tell patients that we would like them to irrigate if you have symptoms, and if you have a history of chronic rhinosinusitis, some people say at least once a day, some people say twice a day. Do I have patients, especially after surgery, they tell me I do rinse every once a week or so? That's true. Um, so. If you have symptoms, absolutely, you should use it. If you don't, do you not have to use it? The answer is you don't have to. But if you are already in a cycle of repeated sinus uh, infect infections, inflammations, and symptom control, and you're not quite there yet, I would say stick to the rinses until you get a regimen that works. And then we can talk about uh, taking things away from that regimen. How do you distinguish whether it's a allergy or an infection? I mean, that, that's with a swab and a, a culture? Correct. If we can see some, I, first I start with the history. I listen to what the patients have to tell me in terms of where and how the symptoms are bad. What's, is it worse during certain seasons? Is it worse during certain areas? Is it uh, worse when uh, they're exposed to certain uh, things in the air or certain places that they're working at? Then when those things, uh, when I, they give me those, is there itching of the eyes or itching of the nose or sneezing? Then I start to think more of our, the allergic aspect. And we can talk, I try them on a trial of nasal steroid spray with an antihistamine spray together. And if that gets under control, we're okay. If not, we talk about allergy testing. And the reason why I reserved allergy testing later is because the testing involves uh, a significant amount of investment from the patient. Uh, it can be so, some levels of needle sticks that will be involved to test, uh, or blood tests. It depends on the allergist. And there's costs associated with that as well. And the purpose of that is not just to find out if you're allergic to something, but also, in my mind, is also to see if you're a candidate for immunotherapy. And that requires a significant uh, amount of investment from the patient's perspective, anywhere from three to five years of investment. So I reserve that for somebody who's not controlled on medications to see if we need to find out more. Other times I use it is when patients want to see, hey, I really want to see if there's something that I can do that will help me avoid this issue. Then in those cases, I will go ahead and do an allergy testing referral. Can you talk about biofilms? You mentioned biofilms yes. as a source. Are those treatable or is that a chronic condition? Biofilms are treatable. 
uh, they are a chronic condition as well. So as I mentioned, there are collections and communities of bacteria. They start as bacteria that kind of hang out, and then they form a community. They kind of adhere to the surface. And when biofilms kind of got the press, it went everywhere. The people were talking about it in their toothbrush. People were talking about it in um, their nasal saline rinse irrigation bottles. So could it, uh, do we find it? Yes, but are they treatable? Yes. And there are ways to treat that. Uh, Irrigations tend to help, and uh, in some cases, the idea of making things more slippery so that it's harder for things to adhere, such as surfactants. And one kind of surfactant that we like to use is baby shampoo. It can actually get things to slide off and prevent things from adhering, so it is treatable. especially for someone with chronic sinusitis who may want to delay surgery? So uh, what, is, what are my opinions of balloon uh, sinusitis? So in my opinion, balloon sinusitis is a tool, as I mentioned before, rather than a substitute for surgery. So it's designed as a tool to try to enlarge whatever opening a person may have. Now, as I mentioned, for chronic rhinus sinusitis, it's an inflammation of not just the tissue, but thickening of the bone. And imagine if you put a balloon in there, it doesn't do anything to the bone. It can squeeze out the fluid in the tissue, but it isn't really going to solve the core of the problem, especially if you have bone inflammation. Now, that being said, it is a very uh, attractive new technology and has gained a lot of popularity um, because of that. However, I it's, I'm not saying that it's not a good instrument. I'm saying that it's an instrument that does not necessarily replace another instrument. It's simply a tool that helps us achieve our goal, which is to get control of the chronic rhinosinusitis symptoms. Um, is a vasomotor rhinitis related to this? And if so, could you talk about it? Sure. The, uh, the question was, is vasomotor rhinitis associated with this? Uh, no. Uh, in the sense that uh, what I talked about today was chronic rhinosinusitis. So it's an interplay of infection, inflammation, and uh, anatomical or some sort of ciliary dysfunction. Whereas uh, vasomotor rhinitis, we're talking more about uh, a, a draining, dripping, runny nose. Now, is runny nose a symptom of chronic rhinosinusitis? It is but vasomotor rhinitis is an, a different entity compared to chronic rhinosinusitis. Yes? Can you say something about complications of surgery and how common that would be? Yes, sure. So the question was, can I talk about complications of surgery? So um, all surgery has complications uh, or known complications and can have complications. Uh, the sinus surgery that we know now is very different than the sinus surgery that we used to do, and it has been deemed in the Cochrane Review as a safe procedure. That being said, uh, let's think about the neighbors of the sinuses, and that can help kind of, dis, uh, kind of illuminate some of the complications that could happen. So the sinus neighbors are the eyes and the brain, and hence you could have issues where there can be... Uh, Issues with eyes, such as blindness um, or blurry vision. You can have issues of brain hurt, uh, or brain fluid that can leak into the nose. Uh, there is, you should have, expect some level of bleeding after the surgery, as I mentioned, because we don't pack the nose. But you could have uh, a large amount of bleeding, in which case you may require packing in those instances. Uh, so those are some of the more known complications for sinus surgery. How common are they? They are extremely rare. However, they are known to exist, but they're very, very rare. If you irrigate your sinuses and you use the steroid spray, should you use them one before the other, or does it matter? Or so uh, I think it depends on who you ask. Uh, for my preference, the way I like to make this analogy is it's very similar to painting a dirty house. So what I like to describe it is I would like my patients to clean the outside of their house, so do the saline first, and then put the steroid spray as if you're painting a now clean house so you have a pretty looking house. 
And so that's the, that's the way I describe it, so that it's much more effective. So when I have my patients rinse, I tell them to go ahead and rinse out their nose and then wait about five, 10 minutes. If you've rinsed, you'll notice that after you do, you still have some drainage for a little bit. Then after that, I ask them to do the nasal steroid spray. And as I mentioned, more towards in and out towards their sinuses. Uh, two sprays each side is often what I ask them to do twice a day. Is it common to have to repeat the surgery every couple of years because swelling and bone enlargement can come back, number one? Uh, and number two, uh, are there any side effects you know, to long-term? There are probably some studies out there that are fairly long by now to the use of Nasacort AQ or other, uh, other spray steroids. So uh, the question was, the first question was, is it common to have to have revision surgeries over and over? And number two was, what are the long-term side effects of topical nasal steroids? And in terms of the first question, now, it's, as I mentioned, this is a chronic rhinosinusitis. It is a chronic disease. The surgery is not in at least in my hands, it is not and in our community. We don't consider it to be a cure-all, be-all, or a substitute for medical therapy necessarily. It would decrease the chance and the amount of medical therapy you may need significantly. So is it common? I would say no, but does it happen? It does. And those are what we call recalcitrant or uh, more difficult chronic rhinosinusitis patients. And for those patients, we have a different uh, kind of therapy that we do in terms of surgical as well as medical therapies that we can do to create more openings than we would typically do for a rhinosinusitis patient in their first time surgery. We, it would be the idea of, um, I think all of us would probably say it doesn't make sense to give patients who have uh, a pre-diabetes or small levels of diabetes insulin to start out with. But it would make sense for we, us to start them out on a pill, and if that didn't work, to then to the, give them insulin. This is the same idea. And not everybody that has is controlled, their diabetes controlled on pills is going to necessarily go on in, uh, injection insulins. So by the same token, for chronic sinusitis, there are many patients that are treated with surgery followed by topical therapy, and that's it. However, there is a small percentage of people that do need repeat surgery and more aggressive medical therapies. In terms of side effects of long-term long -term side effects of topical nasal steroids, there are studies uh, that show that uh, with for, uh, for nasal cord AQ in particular, uh, that one of the slides showed that their bioavailability is slightly is higher. It's definitely higher than Flonase or a Nasonex or some of our lower dose, the ones that we commonly, more commonly use in children. So in theory, could that have some side effects in terms of uh, bone issues or eye issues? It's possible. Uh, what we see more commonly is uh, we can see patients have fungal infections in the back of their tongue or in their throat with chronic uses, and nasal drying and crusting with long-term uh, long use. So, uh, I have a family history of uh, cold sores and uh, particularly in the nose and uh, acyclovir seemed to take care of that? Are there scars left, or can you relate that to anything that you've said? Uh, the question was, can I relate uh, cold sores with sinusitis? And uh, unfortunately, I can't. <laughs> I can uh, come up with creative ways to talk about viral rhinosinusitis which is a known uh, viral rhinosinus is known to be a, a viruses are known to be a cause of acute rhinosinusitis. Now, when it comes to chronic rhinosinusitis, that uh, we think more of an infl inflammatory issue than a viral infective issue. Do you see any reason not to irrigate with the prepackaged bottles of saline solution that you can buy no. that, are, that are sealed and come in the store? Yeah, the question was, do I see any issues with pre-packaged saline packets? None at all. Uh, they work just fine. It's up to the patient and their preference on what they, uh, what they want to do. So the basic soda is not 
important because those things are just saline. Uh, the soda packet has the baking soda in it. It's pH balanced. Oh, I'm talking, but then we're talking about different things. I'm talking about where you, you can go into the drugstore and just buy a little gadget that says saline solution. Ah, so that is, uh, so that's nasal saline spray. Um, that's more like ocean spray. Yep, that's more like ocean spray uh, or nasal mist or ocean mist in some of those. Those are not as effective as irrigations because of the volume that's delivered, at least in our studies. So we need at least 100 milliliters, which if you look at those bottles, I think they come in 50. So you would need two of those bottles to go in at once on one side for them to be effective. So we're talking about irrigations when we're talking about nasal saline uh, for chronic rhinosinusitis, not so much nasal sprays. Are you saying 100 milligrams, 100 cc's on each side? Okay, I didn't understand that. I just wanted to mention one thing about At least. this. Yeah. Um, while you were talking about this, I was told by the pharmacist that if you had an infection in your nose, dispose of it. Don't continue using it. Yeah. So, it. yes. So, wait. Uh, the pharmacist said that you should not use it if you have been using it, or what was the... If you were using it while you might have had an infection, a sinus infection, that you should, when, it, when that's healed, and you're just continuing to use this spray to use a pressure. The question is, if you were using a nasal saline bottle uh, before or while you were having an active infection, is it a good idea to use it afterwards, or should we get a new bottle? And uh, the answer is, it depends on who you ask, but uh, it is uh, true that at least with the nasal saline irrigation bottles, the ones that I showed you, the black and white ones, or the ones where you can squeeze with the hole on top, they can be sterilized at home. Whether you put them in the microwave or you put them in the dishwasher, they can be sterilized and they're okay. Now, when it comes to bottles and reusing it, I think generally it probably isn't a good idea if you know you had a very bad infection. However, it, there's no like clear, you know, randomized study that says you should definitely not use it. It's probably, but we don't advise you to use it. That is true. What do we know about what makes a person susceptible to these kinds of problems and therefore how to get healthier so that it becomes less of an issue? So the question is, what makes a person more susceptible to these issues? And that kind of goes to the core of the pathophysiology issues. So is it the question, and we are actively researching that and we're trying to find out the answer to that. And for some, it is an issue of the way our cilia works. And for some, it can be genetic issues that we're actually looking at in terms of, you know, are there certain genes that, makes, that make people more uh, susceptible to getting sinusitis and developing chronic sinusitis versus people that are not? And there are new research going on uh, that, uh, that are looking into that. And I definitely encourage people to uh, talk to me later on or about it, uh, and we can talk about actually certain people who are doing those research and where you can find more information about that. Um, what are some of the more serious health issues that someone can have after a period of, say, many years of chronic sinusitis that just hasn't been controlled? So if you had long-term, it's uh, more an issue of quality of life and an issue of fatigue and an issue of uh, missed and lost days of work. So, and that can, that has a significant impact on a person's happiness and how they, how they live. Uh, but in terms of if you had chronic rhinosinus, would you die? The answer would be no, you, you wouldn't necessarily die. But uh, the your quality of life would be pretty bad. Um. Somebody who has chronic rhinosinusitis, are they likely to get sick more frequently? Like yes. Correct. Uh, the question was, you know, if you have a history of chronic rhinosinusitis, or is it, uh, is, it like, is it possible that you could get sick more often or get, sick, or get more fatigued more often? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. We know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with a quarter of flu, yeah, we know that that is true. Amen. That we don't know. We don't, the question was why do they seem to be that way, and the answer is that I, I, we're not sure. You also mentioned that uh, they don't sleep as well. Correct. A lack of sleep. Can you tell me why or reference that? Yeah. So it, it depends on the person. 
But yes, if it's an issue, so these are all different aspects of the person's, uh, how their sinusitis manifests. It's different for each person. So uh, if for you, it's the issue that you can't get enough sleep because you're congested, your face feels full, and you have drainage, and you don't smell well, so you're lying in bed, unable to sleep because your head's so heavy, then yes, that's why. Uh, because there's a lot of inflammation in your nose and drainage and secretions that are not going anywhere for you. So that's why you're having a hard time sleeping. So, um, but if you have, but is it the only reason you can't sleep? And the answer is, well, that, that depends on you. Uh, for some people, they may not be able to sleep because they have insomnia. So it's not necessarily that if you can't sleep, you must have sinusitis. It, it's, uh, if you have sinusitis, you may have a hard time sleeping. Is there a connection between sleep apnea and the subjects you've been talking about? So uh, it's more of a connection between uh, acid reflux uh, and asthma than it is with, uh, with rhinosinusitis, although even that, especially with acid reflux, it's not very clear. Uh, but sleep apnea, not, necess not necessarily, not at this time at least. So okay. I guess we have time for one more. Post-nasal drip, yes. is that by itself without the presence of any kind of headache, pressure in your cheeks, gums, anywhere, a sign of a sinus infection or sinusitis? No, uh -huh. not necessarily. Uh, the, for the diagnosis of chronic rhinosinusitis, you need to have multiple symptoms, at least two of the major symptoms, and uh, like facial, con facial pressure, congestion, nasal congestion. Uh, those you need to have that in addition to drainage. Could this person have what, that, what might that be, an allergy? Or? It can be an allergy. It can be vasomotor rhinitis. It can be other causes that just leads to drainage. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.